let me ask you before I open it, uh, before I look at the questions that the audience is uh, asking you. In, in, in uh, one of your uh, earlier meetings, not here, with the Munich Security Conference Core Group, you laid a great deal of emphasis on uh, democracy and how uh, the growth of democracies in our neighborhood and general collaboration internationally between democracies can help us uh, deal with uh, the future security challenges. Now, I ask this question because uh, when it comes to our security challenges in this uh, region, actually, the world's greatest democracies have never really helped us. And the democratic factor has never been an important one in their entire policy framework towards us. Actually, we've seen just the opposite, that at various points in time, they have collaborated far more with non-democracies in our region and elsewhere. So um, I also find that our Prime Minister is laying emphasis on democracy and is building strong relationship with global democracy. So can you elaborate a little bit what exactly uh, you would uh, expect now of uh, um, major democratic countries helping us to get, and working together with us to deal with common security threats? Uh, well, I think uh, good that you reminded me of the Munich conference, and uh, yes, I had been laying emphasis on that. Well, it has got an internal dimension. I would not like to discuss that because it is very obvious that democracy is, uh, is uh, this thing that we empower the people, we carry the people, and the nation becomes strong because the people are strong. But I'll come to the security aspect of it in the international region. What happens that when the policy making in the countries are sensitive to the larger public opinion, in those societies, the hawkish decisions are less likely to come. And when they take a more composite view, we find that there are less of the security conflicts. Now, for example, say in Pakistan, if Pakistan it was not overshadowed by the army or the intelligence apparatus of that country, probably the leaders would see a much greater reason that, well, carrying on terrorism is not the next best policy for them. They would have given it up as an instrument of a state policy because it bleeds the country within. The non-democracies also spend disproportionate amount on their defense buildup and the uh, um, uh, build, uh, acquiring the military hardware. And then we have got to maintain a certain amount of a parity. Of for if, if, and if it is for making a credible deterrence, you have got to make it higher. So you get into the competitive arms race. Now, European Union countries were able to come together mainly because most of them were, became the democracies, were the democracies. And that is why it is becomes much more easier that there is a people-to-people -people contact, there is a political engagement. So I think that if we take it in the long term, then democracies go for war less frequently, and even when they go, it is against the non-democratic regimes, than when the two democracies fight. But I'm talking only in the contemporary this thing, and not that there are no exceptions. There are exceptions, but by and large, the democratic societies have focused more on problems of the people, on economic development, on growth and empowerment of the people and enabling the civil society rather than preparing themselves for war. In that uh, conference, uh, you also said that uh, IS and Al-Qaeda do not yet pose a threat to India despite attempts to enlist support from India's huge Muslim population, and you expressed the view that we can uh, cope with this threat. Can you elaborate a little bit what makes you feel so confident? Uh, I don't, uh, but probably this question should have been asked, but meant for a particular audience. But I can tell you one thing. That is, I, I, uh, I very strongly feel that is why the threat posed by the ISI or some of the radicals this thing can bleed this country, but the inherent strength of this country is so strong that is, it is not going to degrade this country or its listening. And I think there is plenty of proof about it. We have been able to maintain the, the fundamental... After all, why is India a nation? We don't have the same language, we don't have the same religion, we don't have the same dress, same food, there's nothing. But still we are a nation because we are essentially a civilizational state. And this civilizational state has got the tremendous capacity, tremendous resilience to take on the world. No other country probably will find that so many uh, policemen have died in encounters against terrorism and the 
it really doesn't matter. The society takes it as a strength. Now, this capacity to take the, this thing is a very, very high capacity. So they can bleed us, they can create some human tragedies and others, but I think if any country feels that India as a state will get degraded because of terrorism or because of the fundamentalist things and others, I don't think that that's the right. It is not that fragile in the state. Its inherent strength lies somewhere beyond its physical things that the newspaper has seen. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Um, what do you have to say on the combined activities of China and Pakistan in the POK? And what will India do to counter it? Well, there are uh, reports that uh, there have been some uh, construction work, there have been certain roads and probably the system which have got strategic import for us. We have got to factor it in, we have got to see its consequences, particularly if it's passing through the areas which are in POK, which are close to our very existing border, and actually that is our own territory. Uh, we should take it up, and I think we have taken it up from the time to time with the concerned uh, with China and with Pakistan. And um, it is a matter that a strategic view and a strategic cognizance of it needs to be taken. And I think uh, the government should uh, pre 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 prepare itself for its possible consequences. There is a related question to the one I asked you earlier. As per Indian government estimates, how many Indian Muslims have joined the jihadists in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan? I think uh, in this crowd there are better people than me present who can give answer to this question. I don't have any definite numbers, and I think all numbers are very speculative. But what we know for certain is that there have been at least five or six cases where some youth showed some inclination to join the ISIM. It was their parents who approached the police and the intelligence agencies, or the intelligence agencies got in touch with them, and sought their help and assistance in preventing their war from joining us. Now, this is where India is different. And that's what when I was talking to the Australian security agencies from where a large number of about 1,200 people have gone, where I think it is below 10 in this country, if at all anybody has gone. There are very few confirmed reports. Two confirmed reports we have got, one who died and one about the victim. Uh, rest of it we do not know. Uh, maybe that will come to know. But in any case, it will be more than 10. But the bigger thing is, that see the entire ulema of India, not even one religious leader, a Muslim religious leader of this country has supported it. All of them have issued fatwas against it. They have issued that it is an un-Islamic. They have said that it is wrong. They have given a very, very strong message to their own community that it should not be done. That is the strength of India. It is their people, their own friends, their relatives, their parents, that even if somebody has been misled by propaganda in the electronic media or in the social media and others, that is they have prevented them rather than encouraged them. Whereas the contrast in, in France from, from where 2,000 boys have got to the very minuscule population, there they say their experience is entirely different. That is the entire community comes to shield them. Nobody gives any information. And even if when people are dying, they celebrate it as a very great uh, service that they have done to their religion and to their society. So I think that is where the, uh, the real strength of the Indian society and Indian population is. Another question from the audience. It is said that the next war is not going to be fought on the ground, but in cyberspace. We would like to know in such a situation, what is our national critical infrastructure protection plan to secure our federal assets? Well, I think you're very right. I totally agree that cyberspace is going to be the new frontier of, uh, of this thing because in this, uh, not only the states, but even the private actors have become very, very active. What are our plans for dealing with it? I think I, can, uh, I cannot tell it in such a short time, but we are totally seized up. And we are also aware that we have got a lot of advantages to our site. We have got a huge uh, um, uh, experience scientific capability, and the young boys who are very good at that work. We are engaging and we are working on it very, very hard and at different levels. You know, also the cyber war is fought at different levels. One of the problems that we have got is that technologically we have lost out on certain areas where the root servers are all in the control of countries, uh, uh, you know, not under our control. And there are a lo lot of these control systems which are with the West. 
mainly with the United States. Uh, they are helpful to us in some areas, but they are not necessarily always helpful, and particularly in the corporate world. There are corporations that are very powerful and they use it, and I don't want to name them, but they have become very, very powerful. Now, what would be our counter-existing of it without completely denying to our people the advantages of the total cyberspace connectivity? The cyberspace connectivity is also a powerful engine for growth, development, and communication with the people. But I, I can assure you that, uh, um, at least for the last six months that I know, this has been one of the primary areas of national focus. And we have done a lot. We have got best of the scientists, we have got best of agencies for developing the right systems and the right infrastructure. We have had certain bad experiences in the sense that some of our um, uh, sites have been at times uh, interesting that they, our adversaries have tried to attack them, just things like that. But the protection that we have been able to provide is, I think, much far out. Um, we don't have much time left. Last uh, question. You, you you said in an earlier speech that if we have similar democracies in the region, that could be one of the very shortest drivers of India's security. And today you've spoken about India's soft power in dealing with, uh, with China. Can you elaborate on this a little more? Sure. Does, this, does this mean also at some point in time that uh, we will uh, support democracy in Pakistan and find ways and means of doing it? Well, democracy as an ideology, our supporting it is something that we have been supporting right from the time that we got independence. But the internal affairs of any country, what sort of government and what sort of existence they should have at the executive level, at the executional level is their prerogative. And I don't think that India should, be, should become a champion of telling that, well, how to bring them, what is democratic and what is not. Because everybody claims itself to that we are totally democratic. When Pakistan thinks that we are totally democratic. But More important point is that the biggest help to cause of democracy in the region, if you think that it makes the region more secure and stable, is that India becomes a success. If India with all its inequality, if India with all its deprivation, when it got independence, we have got a very, very small percentage of people who really understood the democracy, who really understood the power of their vote, that is, we have empowered them. If we are able to grow at a fast rate, if we are able to socially, politically, economically empower people and make it a, a, a model of success, I think that will be the biggest service to the democracy and that will have large discovery. For example, in Bangladesh, we thought that the, the, the democracy had started becoming this thing and it was going towards the <coughs> little radical path and little this move of the you know, the army was also getting active at some points of time in the leading areas. But now it has come on a, on a this thing like that, and there is increasing public awareness. And they all quote that, see India. Yeah, India has been able to make uh, a very spectacular progress. If democracy can work there, why can't it work in other countries? Myanmar, which was, we know that well, has the military junta from 1962 after Nevin took over, has this thing like that. But now, gradually, the democratic movement has become stronger. As it has become stronger, its proximity, our look is policy, will become much easier for us with the democratic uh, uh, government in Myanmar. Well, like that, well, I don't want to go into each country's those things, but I think the democracy in our system, in the long run. Well, again, as I said, these factors are mitigating factors and not eliminating factors. It is not that they will completely eliminate the threat or the problem. They will create new set of problems, but those new set of problems can be addressed through negotiation, through creating the vested interest by creating the, uh, the interdependence on each other, but in the non-democratic regime, it becomes much more difficult to engage in negotiation. Well, I think the, this board is flashing times up, time up, time up, so I think we have to call this session to a close. I'll invite all of you to give a big hand uh, to the National Security Advisor.